the people that have been here for um, tens of thousands of years have always integrated really closely. Um, and so today we're talking about um, how we've managed to kind of separate those things. So having that, that moment of thinking about uh, the land that we're on and the history of that land is an important way to situate our conversation. Um, I do need to start by thanking our sponsors. Uh, we couldn't do what we do at Vancouver Opera without their support. Uh, so I'd like to start first by acknowledging the organizations that are uh, making our production of uh, Love OM possible. So that includes uh, Mission Hill, who's a production sponsor, and then we have a number of production patrons who um, allow us to have the amazing artists that we have performing for you at the Queen Elizabeth Theatre. So that is Yoshiko Karasawa, um, the amazing Martha Lou Henley, Allen and Gwendolyn Pyatt Foundation, and Mike Kaki Gallagher. And I also like to acknowledge uh, YDR, who is our youth and uh, community engagement sponsor. So can we take a second and acknowledge them again? Around the the events uh, today, so um, just be aware of the fact that we've got a camera in the back and, and we'll be live streaming uh, the event and hopefully we'll get some participation uh, through patrons online who are um, uh, want to contribute to our conversation. So we're here tonight um, to discuss a topic that is inspired uh, by the Sydney's Love OM, opens February 14th, Valentine's Day, makes a lovely gift. Um, the opera premiered in Turin uh, in 1896. And the libretto is based on a book of short stories written by um, Henri Mugère. The stories in the book are based on his observation of the artists and residents living in the Latin Quarter of Paris. Audiences have loved this opera from its first performance, and within the first 10 years of its existence, it had uh, premiered in Brazil, Australia, the United States, Europe, uh, the UK, and Russia. Boehm represents a moment in the history of opera where the stories Sorry, my pages are out of order. Ah, where the stories on stage began to reflect the lived experiences of their audiences. Somehow, we have become separated from the fact that opera was the entertainment of the people. It was meant to reflect the experiences and lives of the audiences that were there. But uh, composers like Wagner and his piece Parsifal, which included the trials and tribulations of King Arthur, and uh, the upper classes that were described by Verdi in Don Carlo, which were written both about the same time as Bohème. Puccini's opera tells the story of artists who are struggling to, meet, to make ends meet. The love story between Mimi and Rodolfo, the relationship between Musetta and her wealthy benefactor, Alcindoro, and her tempestuous relationship with Marcello continues to resonate with audiences all over the world. Boehm, like the literature and operas written at the same time, portrays artists as largely romantic figures who have chosen to live the bohemian life on principle, essentially illustrating the long-held trope of the starving artist. The idea that to choose the life of an artist is to accept a life of poverty and all its associated instability is a deeply held belief in our public consciousness. In our conversation this evening, we will be exploring the condition of instability in relation to not only housing, but work, performance spaces, funding, and audience development, and its related impact on the cultural life of Vancouver. To situate our conversation this evening, I've asked Richard and Gila Salman to share his personal story of living and working as an artist in Vancouver. Richard is an award-winning visual artist who is one of the 2018 to 2021 Artist Studio Award recipients from the city of Vancouver. This Artist Studio Award program offers seven subsidized artist studios for low-income emerging professional artists. Please give a warm welcome to Richard Akila Excel. Uh, 
2016, uh, I dropped into homelessness. Um, I remained homeless for 20 months. Um, but I never slept on the street. I always had a place, but I didn't have an address. I still try to um, I tried to continue my art practice. I didn't do any new work, but in spite of my homelessness, I, um, I still worked with him, participated in seven exhibitions, uh, Toronto, Windsor. Um, I rented a storage locker to keep my artwork and my clothing. I go to change my clothes at my locker and go to exhibition openings. And nobody really knew that I was homeless. But um, anyways, it was a struggle. And then on, um, in August, um, uh, I was by a meal attack in a mobile range. And the place that I was staying at was someone from that place. Um, suddenly, I was really homeless. I really had no place to go. And that's when I entered the shelter system. Um, I was trying to avoid it.
so that people understand that, you know, an art an artist is a creative person who has spent time being trained and you know learned a craft and a skill. But we are all you know creative beings, and our potential, I believe, lies in our creativity. So, just saying that to put it all in context, I now want to introduce you to our wonderful panelists. Um, next to me is Spencer Chandler Herbert, and. You probably know that Spencer is the provincial member of the legislature for Vancouver West End Cold Harbor and a very strong advocate for the arts. He served as the official opposition advocate for tourism, arts, and culture, and he led the fight against government cutbacks to the BC Arts Council. Now, in his new role, he has successfully championed a recent $5 million increase to the BC Arts Council. Last April, <laughs> Last April he's, he was appointed the head of the BC Rental Housing Task Force and is advising the Premier and the BC government on improving security, fairness, and affordability for renters and rental housing providers throughout the province. Welcome, Spencer. Then next to um, Spencer, we have <coughs> Dr. Nora Angeles. Nora is a, has served as a professor at UBC for over two decades in the uh, School of Community and Regional Planning and the Women and Gender Studies undergraduate program. She works in the area of community and international development, including immigration integration linked to transnational migration and feminist issues. Her most recent research is on alternative transnational economies involving Filipino-Canadian diaspora communities and how neoliberalism is shaping social integration of immigrants in Metro Vancouver. She is also on the board of directors for the, Arisa, am I saying this right, Arasaga Dance Company? Yes. Yeah. So welcome to Nora, Dr. Nora Angeles. David Pay and David is one of the co-founders of the 110 Arts Cooperative at the Post 750. The Post at 750. Thanks. He's also the artistic director and founder of Music on Main, which he created in 2006. He uses intimate spaces to present live classical and new music to make people feel really comfortable, so they can connect with each other and with the artists. He believes that when you feel comfortable, you can listen better. And in a Globe and Mail article featuring David last year, he proudly admitted that after producing 400 concerts, they've only had three cell phones go off. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a great fact. Okay, so welcome, David. Next to him is Alex Sales, and Alex is the head of cultural spaces for the city of Vancouver. She has worked on spaces such as the Vancouver Art, the new Vancouver Art Gallery, the Arts Factory, the BMO Theatre Centre, and funding from development that supported the Western Front to purchase their building, as well as the Grunt Gallery to pay off their mortgage. Her current portfolio includes area and community planning, cultural infrastructure grants, artist award studios, so Richard probably knows her well, working with cultural tenants in city spaces, Regula regulatory work, as well as negotiating new cultural spaces for development. Alex has worked in cultural services at the City of Vancouver for over 17 years. Her previous roles included project lead on public art program review and the Olympic and Paralympic public art program. Welcome, Alex. <laughs> Last but not least, we have Jude Kuznieras. Close enough. Jude is a visual artist, and she also works as the executive director of the Beaumont Studios, where there are over 80 artists who lease the space. She's a champion of affor for affordable artist spaces, and she's spent 15 years committed to creating and managing a sustainable arts community in Vancouver. So welcome to Jude. So what we're going to do is we're going to give each one of these lovely folks um, about, you know, <coughs> somewhere between, you know, around eight, seven or eight minutes to uh, talk about a topic that is dear to their hearts. 
and then I'm going to listen deeply and have a question for them afterwards. So, who'd like to go first? I would not. <laughs> you want me to uh, just choose someone? Okay. Well, Alex, why don't you kick us off this? <laughs> okay. Um, uh, first off, I really want to thank you, Richard, for sharing your story. I really appreciate you coming, and I want to note that Richard was awarded the studio space because of his achievements as an artist. Um, so. Uh, we found out, I found out after about your situation that you had been in previously. So I um, just really want to thank you for that. So um, uh, within my portfolio, as, 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 as Brenda mentioned, we, we do a lot at the city. We have a lot of things that we're working on from grants to uh, negotiating the new spaces to making sure arts and culture is integrated into area and uh, community planning. We work on regulatory work as well. And we have our studio program. Um, some of the spaces that we've, uh, uh, we have over 200,000 square feet of space that we've, we've negotiated through many, many contributions, the post, um, which David will talk about is one of them. Uh, and we have some artist housing at Main and Second uh, that we're working on 30 units coming up and an artist hub and some arts production space in the downtown. Um, but that isn't what I want to sort of talk to you about today. What I want to talk to you about is in the um, uh, last July, uh, we went to council with our new, as part of our creative city strategy that we're working on at the city, is kind of as we're launching that, we did our Making Space for Arts and Culture, which is our cultural infrastructure plan, and uh, we kind of wanted to know where we're at and where we need to go over the next few years. And we really want to make Vancouver a place where artists can not only um, you know, can live and work and share their work. I want to share with you some of the, the data, sort of, sort of what we found out and where we think we're going. So. As we see um, a huge increase in urbanism, um, you know the, the need for culture and cultural expression and identity becomes more and more important. And in fact, the creative industries are the largest growing sector in the world, according to the UN. And, and in Canada, you know we, we, we think about arts and culture as kind of we don't think about it in economic terms, but in fact, it represents over seven percent of Canada's G, GDP. Um, and uh, and BC has, has the highest number of artists, and Vancouver has the highest concentration of artists. So we have, there's something in the water, it's or in the air in Vancouver, and it's a, it's a very creative place. Um, but 65% uh, of artists um, are living below the poverty line. So we have a huge sort of, uh, sort of separation um, uh, that I wanted to, to share with you. So obviously when we, when we are findings, when we, we, we looked at cultural spaces, we talked to everyone we could. And uh, the challenge for space, for cultural space, is exactly the same as affordability challenge for housing. It's no different. And um, it, 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 what we're seeing is like even as we sort of um, struggle to create, say, more housing, we see a lot of displacement of, of cultural spaces and of artists because they're typically in um, cheaper places that are, Jude's going to talk about this. Are, are rezoned for something else. And so, you know, they, they face high property taxes, they face um, development coming forward. And then, you know, another uh, uh, thing that came to the forefront of the work that we did is in 2014, um, a Canada, uh, the, the city of Vancouver uh, acknowledged that we're on the unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Swinomish. And there's very little visibility of the local nations on the land or for cultural space. So that and equity and access and accessibility of our spaces became another a huge um, piece of work and issue that was identified. Another thing that was uh, um, pointed out by the community or, or how the community felt is they kind of felt that the city of Vancouver, um, we have some priorities like Green City and we have a housing strategy, but culture wasn't really on the agenda. Like, why aren't we talking about culture? Culture is kind of a the soul of, of who we are and why is that uh, not a high priority. And then of course, um, I'm sure anyone here who's done any renovations or any building or anything knows that we have some huge regulatory challenges um, within the city um, because we have really high standards. We really want to have, we want to be the greenest city and we want to do a lot of things. Um, and so those really face um, our arts organizations and our artists 
So we kind of took a step back and said, okay, well, where are we at? Everybody wants to know, well, this is what's going on in Vancouver. What's going on everywhere else? You know, what, what's happening? And of course, we, there's an organization called the World Cities Culture Forum. It's about 40 world cities, and they've done a lot of work uh, talking about arts and culture and artists and cultural workers. And of course, Vancouver um, looks like every other world should be. Like, we're seeing the same thing everywhere else. We're seeing this displacement and uh, loss of spaces. And I think the most compelling work that I've heard of recently is coming out of London, where in the last eight years, they've lost a third of their underground music spaces. Um, so they've had to develop a whole strategy about, like, what, what are these? Are they usually pubs? Or, you know, other small places or, you know, sort of underground. Um, and they've lost 30% of their artist studios um, as well. So when I was talking about this to council last year, my point was I, I go to meetings a lot and I get asked by other city staff, you know, how do we become more like Terrace or London or New York? How do we how do we become like that? And I say, I don't think we really want to become like that. Like maybe we should take a step back because uh, the artists don't live there anymore. They don't if you talk to artists from London, they don't live in London anymore, they don't work in London because it's not affordable. So we have an opportunity in Vancouver to really change that and to think about what we're doing and what our um, policies and things might want to be. So just to kind of close on, I mean, we have a, there's, if you're super interested in cultural space, like, like a Paul Bazaar, there's a, there's a yeah, there you can go look at Making Space for Arts and Culture and look at our report. We'll be going back to council in July of this year as part of our Creative City strategy. We'll be talking about specific actions and things we want to do, but generally where we want to go around space is to really make sure arts and culture is a priority in city building, that it's really a part of city building, um, and that, um, we really incorporate reconciliation, equity, and access um, into the work that we're doing. We're doing a lot, um, but we can, we can do more there. And that we, there's a lot of tools we can use, like I've talked a bit about community amenity contributions and things like that. There's other things we can do around intangible cultural heritage, around density bonus, and there's some interesting things uh, that we can look at. And then most importantly, to really recognize the strength within the community sitting at this table, for example, um, that we have, and to really support um, community-led initiatives and projects as they're moving forward. So you know, we'd really love to see um, some more control. Everybody knows how difficult it is to be a renter in Vancouver. Can you imagine if you're an artist renting a studio or a production space or a cultural organization that has a budget of $100,000 a year? Um, so, you know, i.e., most people aren't being paid. So, so, so you're, 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 we really, um, we have some really incredible things, and I think we have a real opportunity in Vancouver to um, move ahead and really make it a key part of who we are as a city. Great. That comes to mind for, uh, to me from what you've said is that are there examples of cities in the world who are doing it right? that you know of, that you could talk about? Well, I did ask them to let me travel around the world. <laughs> <laughs> or to join the World Cities Culture Forum. Um, I, you know, we were down in San Francisco, because it's a very similar city to Vancouver, and it's a little bit ahead. And I was actually kind of shocked. Um, you know, some there's cities that have certain things they do that are more. But certainly the many negotiation piece that we do where we negotiate with developers in Vancouver is ahead of others. Um, there's some really interesting things happening in Oakland and how they support people because they've had some really tough situations in Oakland. But Oakland's had a horrible situation like in 2008 where, you know, most of the black community lost their homes and mm -hmm. left the city um, because they lost their homes. So I, I feel like sometimes in Vancouver, like we work, I work kind of at the edge of the downtown east side and I feel like we're not really making progress, but when I went to San Francisco and kind of saw what was happening there, I feel like there's actually a lot of really amazing things happening in Vancouver. And so I, I'm not sure that there's any particular city that's on the forefront. Right. Do you know if Brussels is doing anything specific to attract all the artists who are moving there from Paris, from Berlin, from London? Brussels or Berlin? Yeah. Yeah. To Brussels. Oh, okay. They know so many people who yeah. have to Brussels. No, not so much. Yeah. yeah. Usually it's probably, it's just literally like right. Or an amazing studio program. Great. Thank you.
very much, Alex. So uh, why don't we go to June next? She can give us an experiential speak to my heart. Um, my name is June Kuzner, and, and thank you um, all for coming out and gathering um, to share our experiences and knowledge. And, um, I uh, started out, founded an organization called the Beaumont Studios in 2003. Um, I founded it after the wake of a fire, an electrical fire in this building that I used to make art out of. Um, well, my studio was affected by the actual fire itself. The building was closed down, and I found myself standing on the street after eight years of running a glass painting business that was doing $500,000 plus a year and employing four or five other artists at Fulton Theaters, selling to stores all across North America, all from a small Asian dispersal studio in Mount Pleasant. And suddenly I was standing on the street fighting my insurance company, trying to figure out how to stay afloat after 9-11, and Americans weren't buying my product anymore, and NAFTA was saying they didn't want to allow my product in the States because they were made in France originally. And there was so much happening, and, and um, a lovely lady gave me a space to use and, and stay afloat until I figured out what I was going to do. And in the process of doing that, I would stand in front of the window of the space and think to myself, wouldn't it be amazing if we had an artist space that was shared with other artists who were also in business for themselves? And we have a gallery here and a theater here, and people would come and they would see through the windows to makers of things. I would cross pollinate my clients with jewelry designers and painters. And, so I wrote a business plan and presented it to the owner of the building and it was accepted. And suddenly I was managing an artist colony with 16 studios, a small performance space, and a gallery. And um, that was in 2003. And in that time, the neighborhood around me has grown so, um, just, it's just the, the zoning has changed, the uses, just, not the zoning, the usages have changed, and now they're building four-story buildings around us. When we started this space, within six months, the building was literally 90 to 95% fully occupied. Um, and in the 15 years we've been there, we've been almost 100% occupied with artists. We've tried to subsidize their rents through live performance and gallery openings and, and um, membership donations. But every year, the, the pressures of, of overhead come in and just negate every bit of work that we do need to keep this art space alive. And so all of the artists in our space feel that same grunt in the process because they pay their rent and then next year the rent goes up. And for an artist, and I'm not sure who's the artist here, but as an artist, the cost of goods that you produce, um, you put in to produce a piece of product, cost blank, and then each year that goes up and then your rent goes up. And so if I sell a piece of jewelry that costs $50, and the next year my rent goes up $40. To sell this piece, I now have to sell three of these just to make $40 for the rent increase that's come our way. So I represent probably 80 artists, performance, um, makers of things, photographers, visual artists, um, shoes, glass blowers, and all of them feel the same pressures of, of just the cost of being in a space. So we look at where we are, we look at where we can go, and there's just there's, there's just no places left. There's like if we close our doors, eighty artists would be displaced. And so it's it's sad, but it's beautiful because everybody comes and volunteers and does their time to keep the space alive, to keep the arts alive, and and we're just sitting in a really interesting little conundrum in Vancouver because the city supports what we're doing, the community supports what we're doing, the council supports what we're doing, and then, but then there's like this unknown, there's this unknownness that comes in. So, you know, when you look at the arts on the art on the walls of people's homes, I'd almost think that a huge percentage is from winners or home sense and not from the artists that are in our neighborhoods. I've had many, many friends apologize to me when they show me a piece that's really lovely. <laughs> and it's like, I'm oh, sorry, it's from home sense. Yeah, it's fine, but I think this artist would have offered you the same price if you put it on your wall. <laughs> so you, you know, you get to this place where you wonder why you even bother, and a lot of our artists end up moving back into their homes and crafting on their kitchen tables. And and so it's it's been 15 years, and like I said, the city has been 
instrumental in helping us grow into where we are. We're, we're over 20,000 square feet of, of artist space, of live performance, and we have uh, 24 artist studios in the space. And again, we've got the support of everyone around us, so we don't know what we're missing. There's something missing. And then we look out to our community, and a lot of our community can't afford to buy the art. And that's why they will shop at Homestead, because it's affordable and easy. And so it's, uh, so I advocate and try to find solutions to keep this space alive for our artists. But I'm always just left to wonder why, why do artists struggle in a city that's so metropolitan and so full of life? Like it's, it's perplexing. I have a couple of questions to mind. Um, so you, you mentioned that you know the artists would have to go back and work out of their kitchen or wherever. And what what do you think the advantages of the artists working together in this? <coughs> what does it do for their practice or for the community? What do you think the advantages are of being able to be together in a space? So the overhead itself is the like shared social purpose real estate is, is obviously a very value added um, in cost of operation. Um, the collaborations, the cross pollination of clients who come to the space, um, and just like a real camaraderie of people working together and, and um, being on the same journey. Um, again, so our space is, is probably 80% plus populated with professional artists who work full time and are there every day. Um, and you know, you, you walk into work and you see everybody else living the dream. So it's not the financial dream, but the creative <laughs> dream. And it's uh, it's motivating and beautiful. It's, it's full of life. Okay. And then what has to happen logistically? For you to be able to stay in that space, for us to stay in our current space. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, I hate pointing my finger at property taxes because it, it, uh, it's, it's it's very complex. It's not as simple as property taxes, but that's a, that's a big one. So, our particular neighborhood has um, gone through some major usage changes in the last four or five years, and. One of the, the big things is that we pay tomorrow's prices today as it's developing. And so we're being taxed at a rate as if we were, in addition to a potential use in our space. So we're being taxed as if we were a four story high rise building, but we're not a four story high rise building, and we won't be a four story high rise building. Um, but there's a four story high rise building at the end of our street and being built across the street, but we haven't seen the value added from those places into life yet. So we hopefully we'll see those values on the other side, but by the time we get there, we've just suffered so much with financial pressure. You're, you're, so I think what you're trying to say is you're, you're taxed at the assessed value of your building yes. because it can be four stories, that's the value mm -hmm. to the land. So, um, so that's one of the major challenges that we face. Um, in addition to there's, I mean, I hate, I hate ever referencing our space as like the underground art space, but mm -hmm. we're like, we've always been off the beaten path, so now suddenly we're not off the beaten path, but, you know, we're understaffed, underfunded, mm -hmm. funded by the city, by the way, so I don't, not not mm -hmm. anybody here. Um, we're definitely underfunded, and so you have like three staff members operating a space that should have ten, and, and every year that you, you just have to put more money over here just keeping the place alive, you're not making it too good programming and arts and uh, staff. There, there is no, currently no city funding even for space operators. So mm -hmm. the conundrum is if you're an individual artist, it's ideal to have an operator because mm -hmm. an individual artist trying to get spaces is even more challenging. So this has been an issue that was identified in our study for sure. Mm -hmm. um, but when you have a, a pool of funding and that pool is the same pool, mm -hmm. you either take from someone to give to someone else. Mm -hmm. So. It's a very, and Jude isn't the only space operator that's identified this because the Arts Gate 228 um, they all express their struggle. Um, and Jude, we, we did some research on property tax and 
they, I think Jim's studio is the highest percentage of property tax growth of any one of those, something like forty percent in a three-year period. What does that translate to in dollars? Um, so this is 2014, 2014 for today, our property taxes have gone from about $50,000 a month to $96,000 a month. And we haven't seen this recent increase yet. Uh -huh. I'm sorry, here, here, here. So you can, like, a double, like, got the rent, so it's doubling. <laughs> That's so great. Our rent itself has gone um, from, when we, we just took over a new building a few years back. Um, and that was, so that was 2014. Our rent when we took over that building was $28,000, including property taxes, et cetera. And now it's $36,500. The rent and property taxes we've gone up. And that's artists aren't making more money probably than they were back when they mm -hmm. first started. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, thanks, Jude. That looks like a clear picture on things. <laughs> um, let's go um, now to uh, Nora mm -hmm. and hear what um, our other five people. <laughs> well, thank you for the invitation. I want to put it in first the global context in which parties are operating right now. And we're in a vicious cycle globally as far as the artistic community. When you look at the concentration of artists, they are in the wealthiest, densest, and most expensive cities. When you look at the World Cities Cultural Report, you're looking at, of course, New York, Los Angeles, Paris, London, Shanghai, where you have concentration of museums, theaters, artists. And, sorry, Alex, I think Vancouver is really becoming like New York yeah. and Paris. <laughs> <laughs> and, the trend also, so if we're in this vicious cycle, and we look at what's happening in the United States, where there's more research, as I was digging up uh, data for this talk, there's little research in Vancouver, and I really would like to encourage all artists, organizations represented here, if you need researchers, interns, we can approach, you know, faculty members, SFU, UBC, to do the research that we need in order to help in our advocacy. So that cycle is that you're seeing the concentration of artists in cities like Vancouver, 2001, BC, Vancouver, Metro Vancouver has the four, sorry, five out of the top nine municipalities where artists are concentrated. That's the pressure. We can update the statistics, but I don't think it would waver too much from the 2001 survey. Now, where we're seeing, as in the United States, a lot of the artists are also moving to the Rust Belt, cities of Syracuse, Albany, Buffalo, and also the South and Midwest because of the cost of living. And we're seeing even in cities like Sarnia, La Salle, Quebec, St. Catharines, where there is a reduction in labor force, artists are flocking there because of chasing housing affordability as well as lower cost of living. However, they did not wane as far as mobility of artists within Metro Vancouver, Toronto, and Montreal, where we have the concentration of artists. Locally, I want to use Richard's story and Jude's story to talk about the vicious cycle that artists have here in Vancouver. And that loop has to be closed. This is the vicious cycle. We have the precarity of work for artists, and there's a difference between employed artists and the self-employed artists. So there is a distinction there in terms of work precarity situation. Then you have the housing crisis. Shortage, rent increase, gentrification, which leads to the real or hidden homelessness which we were talking about earlier, which is of course linked to the inadequate 
government and public support for housing solutions. We have many radical solutions out there. The whole spectrum of housing options from co-housing to artist community land trusts that have been tried elsewhere. And then you have another part of that vicious cycle, the fact that our artistic community is unorganized which leads to increased work precarity, the fact that the public and government are not listening much to their voices. So how do we close that loop? And there could be many interventions. Richard and a situation in particular closed that loop because of government support. There's clearly government attention there. And more could be done. Artists have to be organized. And more, I think, can be done in order to get that public support, not just for the housing solutions, but also for other things that had been tried elsewhere. And this is, I think, addressing part of the problem uh, or questions that you are addressing. We need to understand the barriers to artist security in housing situation as well as to artist spaces in particular. And as a footnote, I want to say that there's a distinction Alex is focused on cultural space planning. We need to see the linkage between that type of planning with cultural planning services and planning for housing <coughs> and cultural development creative services. Just kind of all three links. So what are the barriers? There's still a strong bias, according to the research, among government funders and part foundations supporting the artistic community towards um, construction and big presentation of artistic work compared to spaces devoted to meeting artists' needs for living and working. One indicator is that the stock of live work studios, according to a small research that one of our students had done, had actually been declining and we need to protect the stock of live work artist studio. I think another evidence too is with CAC, so the community amendments contribution that Alex is talking about. We tend to see this in terms of daycare, senior center, or a library. But <coughs> there are artist spaces as part of a real concrete a CAC instead of, let's say, a public art here and there. Um, we also see in our cultural districts, they're usually featured performance venues, arts retail, but at the exclusion of spaces for the creation of artistic work. Another barrier that I already mentioned is the fact that, and, and this is from a report in 2007, that, that this is only just coming to public attention. <coughs> the need for more affordable space as a fundamental need. Just like this forum, for instance, that's bringing this to our attention. And then the fact, as I said earlier, that our artistic community is not organized and not unionized in order to create cooperatives, I know that you will be talking about that, you know, um, a little later, plus the increased work precarity that I um, mentioned about. As far as solutions that have been tried elsewhere, there are, I'd say, three groups of solutions that we could think about. One is in the area of linking the needs for artists for, for lead workspaces with community economic development and social improvements. In many places, particularly vibrant you know, communities in the United States, and I, and I really want to, to have parallel research to use the same kind of index that had been used in the US as far as city creativity index linked to affordability and um, concentration of artists. In other words, where, where, where are artists going uh, where they can live well, do their, their artistic work, but also provide affordable costs where there's enough community and public support. So in the area, we can find some cities that are coming up with art, arts-based or arts-focused community development corporations. Um, including multi-purpose community spaces and community programming uh, that involves housing artists. 
Artists themselves are getting organized in the second arena where they create viable business ventures that attract private investors and commercial lenders to finance their work. And one of the discoveries that I have working for a uh, company, Eras Gadans, um, is that our artists, not too many of our artists, have the savviness as far as financial literacy. And that's one area. And how do we become more entrepreneurial and also take a stock of their own financial future? Um, so, what are the things that are being done in this in this field? Um, we need more detailed market research, UX, UI research on artists in the area, and how can you we convince pers perspective investors of the viability of you know artists' work, which again we have it's already been proven. In so much research that it brings in so much more. That's why you have the tech hub, it's not surprising, like San Jose or uh, the Silicon Valley. That's also where the concentration of artists are. And the last one is on what services can we provide to artists. Uh, from the point of view of the city, I already mentioned the protection of available work lists to just spaces. We need to explore artistic or cultural community land trust tried elsewhere. To think of artists primarily as we think of this whole housing spectrum from market to non-market, co-op housing, social housing, I'd like to see artists, artists collective, work on co-housing projects and document this and how this could be done. Um, I'd like to see uh, focus on services for artists and artists' special needs such as and needs for spaces for suitable for a particular type of artwork and uh, from sculpture because they have music, dancing, specific different needs for that. And and I think lastly we need to look at um, I, I, again more research to be done in identifying properties. We don't have an inventory of properties suitable for art space <coughs> development in, in, in our city to connect artists with such properties. Where are they in, in Metro Vancouver, and, and not just in Vancouver? Um, document lessons from the experience in um, helping negotiation between artists and uh, landlords, for instance. Um, and the contributions of art space development, uh, building our arguments and evidence around why we need to protect those art uh, uh, spaces. And also to improve, basically, uh, this to create an enabling environment and improve practice among current practitioners to cultivate the next generation of artists who are going to make our cities great through the art and work that they do. So that's my piece. Thank you. Thank you. From what, from what you're saying, it, it seems we need we need more research to support the generation of new models. It's so certain, of course, because I do have no research <laughs> It's very interesting because uh, in the work that I do at the Alliance, I look at a lot of research, and there's so little mm -hmm. around culture in Canada. There's a ton of stuff coming out of the UK, and it is so interesting. Mm -hmm. Um, they are using, they are integrating the arts into healthcare, into education, into all of these other sectors, and they're uh, beginning to realize that um, they can build better societies. We can have, um, uh, it will improve our well-being. They're doing all kinds of studies, and so when I try and find those PhD students or those postdoc students who their interest is not in this area because it's very practical. It's more academic. So we need to solve that. How do we do that? Well, um, the School of Community and Regional Planning and the Institute for Gender Research on Social Justice are two of what I consider um, logical um, academic spaces where this type of research uh, could be done. We have mechanisms, particularly at SCARP, because we, we train you know, cultural planners, heritage planners as well, 
as a community development. You know, I, I see I, I see the community economic development angle of this kind of research to be very important. But we also don't have, um, I think, an idea of what would be the research needs of our arts organization and our and and the cities, let's say. Um, Spaces and we can work it out, and so and our professors are looking at, at this. We do have a critical creative uh, arts for social justice program. It's really more academic, but we do have a practicum in our undergrad program. But again, I don't think we have any artistic community in our roster of potential host agencies for our interns and practicum students. So. There's a lot of, I was talking to Colin earlier, I'm so glad to see a community engagement office within the Vancouver Opera, because most organizations, say, including in D.C., has a public engagement, community engagement portfolio or desk or, or, or office. But how are the connections being made? And so that's a research in itself, you know, who's connected to whom? And how can more dense connections be made? Because we look at the artistic community, the work that they're doing is really so right for increasing the social capital, if I may use that, that the term, uh, like having friends in high places that can support the work. That's one. Uh, having friends in well-connected, you know, decision makers, you know, the, the people we have around the table. But let's bring in, I think, academia, our schools, because. You know, our grade school students can also do research, you know, for, and integrate this in our curriculum. How do we make that happen? Yeah, integration of, of um, academia and, and culture and art. Um, there's a lot of silos, mm -hmm. and we really need to break down the silos. There's no, there's no doubt about that. So, next I'm going to go to Spencer to uh, tell us about what government uh, might be able to do. All right, no, thanks, Brenda. Thank you, everybody, so far. I, I guess uh, first I want to acknowledge the Muskegon and Snow to the Squamish peoples whose territories we are on. And I think it's important to acknowledge that because a lot of the challenges we see now, um, you know, people losing their homes, uh, people losing spaces, losing culture, are challenges that the settlers brought on the First Nations people who were here originally. So, you know, you talk to folks there, they go, oh, you're not dealing with problems that my nation dealt with, you know, 100 years ago or 200 years ago. Uh, you have to remember that. I think we have, and still have to an extent, a gold rush philosophy around a lot of how we do economic development in this province and in this country, and, uh, and that has affected our housing market. So the idea of housing as a commodity that's traded that's let's buy a whole lot of it and it's going to go up in value and then we'll sell it off to anyone from anywhere around the globe. You know, at one point uh, in international markets were saying buy housing in Vancouver, it's going to appreciate the value much faster than gold or art. Or art. You know, the idea of art is a commodity. Um, and we're dealing with that now. You know, I, I think provincial governments used to think that that was a great way to balance budgets because we'd get property transfer tax. We would sell a whole bunch of real estate offshore. Um, people might come use it, or it might be held as a speculative investment. They might come part of the time, and what have you. Uh, that's come back to bite us in the butt as we built out Vancouver. We, you know, we took over Yale Town. We took over Cold Harbor. We took over a whole lot of industrial, previously industrial areas, and now we're going into so-called unsavory areas where developers didn't used to go. And those are a lot of areas that artists work. You know, because they can get bigger spaces, cheaper real estate. Um, and because we have one of the best job markets in the country, uh, because BC still has one of the top economies in the country, more and more people want to come here. It's why my parents moved here. It's why many others moved here. You know, that my parents are artists, so I'm now a politician. I guess I'm an acting politician. And I say I, I still feel like an artist. I produce theater, I produce dance. I directed, I wrote. I sang, I performed, uh, so in a sense, uh, I guess I'm now involved in a different sort of theater, it's just often bad theater. There's <laughs> <laughs> still lots of singing and crying. Uh, and melodrama. And melodrama, yes. <laughs> yes, illusion. Yes, yes, and yes, people who think they're good actors, but might, might not be so much. Uh, 
have lots of lines and scripts. Um, I don't stick to the talking points so well. Um, improv theater, there you go. Um, you know, I, I think what the province, you know, we had a, a belief that the economy could continue in this speculative, just bring in money from overseas to a large extent. And a huge chunk of DC's economy is housing, is infrastructure, is real estate. And let's not forget, you know, we want people to have good homes, we want them to invest, and so on. Um, but it's put in this challenge where you've got people trying to buy real estate with local incomes or trying to rent real estate with local incomes, competing with people with global incomes, uh, which are a lot higher, or even national incomes. As people come here, um, BC generally has uh, an average income that's quite a bit lower than the rest of the country, which has been a challenge we've had for many, many, many years. Um, we also stopped building housing, so middle income housing, co-op housing, low income housing for homeless folks, for folks who could be at risk of homelessness. Uh, a lot of that ground to a stop for the last 16 years. Um, and prior to that, uh, the federal government also stopped building housing in the mid-90s. So we've had over 20 years where very little was done, when prior to that, we were literally getting thousands and thousands of new units built all across the country. Uh, many of the co-ops you see, the social housing you see, was built in the 60s, was built in the 70s, was built in the 50s, um, and then maybe a little bit in the 80s, we still have some co-ops and so on built in the 90s, and then a few that managed to get through the early years of the provincial government in the early 2000s, and then nothing. Um, we're now back in the game. Um, the province is putting in billions of dollars into housing, uh, and that's rental housing, that's co-op housing, that's nonprofit housing. Uh, I saw a friend here earlier who was working with Performing Arts Lodge, a housing project which brought in senior artists who didn't have pensions, they worked in theater, they worked in dance, opera, many other things, um, and has managed to, through working with others who had more money, found a way to create housing that worked for mostly retired folks, but also some folks who are still working part-time in the arts. We need more housing like that, but that's about leadership, and that's about where do we find land. And the city of Vancouver has land, province has money, we're now working together, and we've reached out to the federal government and saying, hey, you've got an election coming up soon, we need to start bringing some of those money that you say is coming uh, 10 years from now, bring it up to now, uh, so don't just talk about it, start delivering more of that money. Uh, so certainly the public sector, the government, nonprofits, the charitable sector all have a big role to play, but we also, of course, need the private market involved as well, and that's, you know, the big criticism these days is, oh, they're building high-priced condos they nobody can afford. Well, of course, brand new housing is always going to generally be more expensive than old housing, so that's obviously a challenge. But we also have things like in Vancouver, if you try to build a new project, it sometimes can take five years to get from the beginning to the end, and that's a huge amount of cost. So can we find a way to get housing built faster? Um, now, in terms of the arts, we need to increase salaries in the arts, but not just the arts. I think um, Professor, uh, Professor Angus has a very good point, that governments go where the people are. Uh, I've long felt a strong urge to invest in arts and the creative economy and support it. Um, when I would bring this up again and again and again with colleagues, some would say, well, why don't you fund my golf game? Why don't you fund my, you know, whatever? You know, there's kind of a bias against the arts amongst a certain group of people who see it as a thrill. Um, that's a challenge. I think there's a really good argument to make for investing in the arts, but we have to make it again and again and again, and collaboratively and collectively. Um, one artist saying, fund me, well, that looks like self-interest. A community saying, fund the arts, it is a community interest. Um, it's about a public, you know, working together. So uh, we've not been the best advocates in terms of that. But we also have to tie in and remember that it's not just artists who work precariously. Um, there sometimes is a self-love that artists have for themselves, I think, in order to get through the day-to-day, -day, that we start to think that we're the only ones sacrificing, or we're the only ones who struggle, and the minute you start talking about that way, you get shut off, because there's lots of people working minimum wage jobs, working two, working three jobs, uh, who can't pay the bills, who are struggling in the same way uh, that artists are. And once we start divorcing artists, this thing that happens over here, I think we've lost the game when it really has to be together collectively. This is something that we want in our society, in our community, as we look out for everyone, including the homeless people, including, you know, who were an artist, who are artists. Uh, you know, and thank you for sharing your story. Um, because we forget that any one of us 
because we'd end up in that situation. And so I think many people in Vancouver, when you look at them, you don't think that they could be, but they are. If they're not homeless, they could be if that paycheck doesn't come through tomorrow. Um, so I urge work for change on the rental housing side, so changing some of our rental rules. A uh, recent change, a uh, landlord used to be able to say to you, I'm going to increase your rent by 50%. I want to apply for a 50% rent increase. If you sign today, you'll get a 20% rent increase. So I had a building full of artists who were going, well, I didn't get a 20% salary increase, let alone a 50% salary increase. So how am I going to pay the bill if this continues? Well, we ended that practice. We said, well, that wasn't fair. Uh, you pay your bills. You know, in, in these cases, these property owners have made a lot of money over many years. The mortgage is all paid off and so on. So you've got to balance, of course, the need to invest in the property with the need to allow people to have some sort of stability. Fixed term leases, another issue which you had artists being told, and everyone, you know, a lot of people is getting more and more people being told, well, you can live here for a year, but at the end, we're going to renegotiate your lease. Um, and this happens for commercial leases, as do those, uh, uh, that, you know, and that's separate from rental housing. Um, but they were trying to make it almost like a commercial real estate situation where you had no security, and every year it could be a 50% rent increase, or you had to leave. So we got rid of that possibility as well. On the commercial side? Uh, on the, we did on the rental side, the residential housing side. On the commercial side, you're still stuck with commercial leasing situations, but you're not. That too. Yeah, the commercial leasing side, you know, <laughs> I, I say, uh, you know, I came here for housing, but no, uh, I, I'd say, you know, the challenge we got on the commercial side is that many large commercial landlords and businesses don't want to touch at all. And there's no unanimity, certainly no big business improvement association is advocating for change. You hear a few small mom and pop businesses, so to speak, uh, saying, well, geez, I'm really hurting from a triple net lease where I get hit with these massive property tax abuses. Because the, the, the zoning has changed. When the, when the taxation changed uh, on residential, the investment really moved over to commercial, mm -hmm. which is why we see this pressure here. So it would be good to have this thing. Yeah, you know, and I think we need more voices on that because I've been trying to get changes to the property taxation side. Because we had down in the West End, for example, beautiful boutique, little shop, chocolate mousse, kitchenware. Uh, nice single business. They've been there for over 20 years. Uh, you know, they want to put in, I don't know, a 20, 30 story condo tower on top of that. So they're now paying the taxes as if they were a 20, 30 story condo tower. But they don't own the property. They see none of the upside. And because they're in a lease, they can't get out of it unless they go bankrupt. And so they're in a horrible situation. But province for many, many years said, well, nothing we can do. It's the city's fault. The city said, no, it's the province's fault. Uh, and it's kind of continued in that way so far. Um, so there are conversations ongoing, but it's uh, it's messy because it, you know if you change the amount one person pays over here, that probably means that change gets pushed over to someone else over there. And they don't want it either. So you know that's the art, the art of politics is compromise and trying to find some way through this, uh, but you have to want to. And I think that means changing you know, how we thought that our economy should develop into one that's a bit more about the people here, and not just about rushing to the next that deliver a golden pan, uh, which I think is how we largely develop the economy up to now. Yeah, I think a lot of us have noticed a significant change in the conversation that had um, a very positive way between province, community, city, and all the stakeholders involved. It's, it's, it's noted. We, we can see it. We don't know what's going to come from that, but we can definitely see that it's also changing. Thank you, Julie. Thank you, Spencer. Um, I think you're absolutely right. I think that artists aren't very good advocates. What I, what I see, having lived on both sides of the street, is that you know when you're an artist, and you're struggling to keep, stay alive, and you're keep struggling to keep your company alive because there's so little resources being invested in it. Um, it's very <laughs> difficult to think outside of that, to join in and to work together to advocate, which is what the BC Alliance tries to do on behalf of artists. We advocate for investment in the arts. And it's very hard to harness our sector because they are so individual and they're such artists. And, you know, we work really hard at it. Um, but we also need, we also recognize at the Alliance that we need to also talk, we also need to get the help of the public. We also need to 
in some ways help the public understand why the arts are important. And so that's one of the things that we're doing. And I, I'm just wondering, what can, what would you say to the folks here? Um, I know what I have to do, right? What would you say to the folks sitting here tonight? What, what could they do to make a difference? Uh, I think one thing that I've learned is that um, for anybody to make change, they have to feel connected to it. Um, and often you can give them all the statistics in the world, and I apologize for the researchers in the world, but you know, statistics matter, and some people communicate only in stats, and they get the numbers and the dollars and the cents. But often what sticks with a person is that personal conversation, is that, uh, that approach, and consistency, persistence. And so, you know, if, if you've never been to see your MLA or your MP or your city councilor or school trustee or park board commissioner, um, give it a try. Um, you know, make that request. Now, you may find some, uh, you know, I've struggled to meet with my own MP for many, many years. Um, but that's a whole other story. Um, you know, but uh, some, some are more accessible than others. Um, but, you know, in terms of the arts, I know if you have a chance where you as an as an artist, an audience member, a board director, or whatever, to go in to make the case, to say, you know, I want to thank you, or I want to congratulate you, or uh, I'm upset that you, you know, to share and to build that relationship. I think um, some of us, I, I can't believe it's been 10 years that I've been in MLA now so far, um, stick around, and we're here for a while, and so it's, it's worth building relationships, um, because you can make change. You realize that the government ship moves incredibly slowly to change course. Uh, sometimes you think, oh my god, it moves so fast, but that's probably because there were years and years of pushing, pushing, pushing. I think the Nelson Mandela quote, it, it always seems impossible until it's done. And then it's like, well, geez, that was easy. Yeah. Um, you know, so build that relationship. It, it's worth it. Um, and a consistent message, if possible. Um, you know, what is it we're trying to achieve? I think the Alliance uh, led the way, along with many others, for a long time, saying, let's increase the BC Arts Council budget so we can invest in the arts. Uh, I said, double the budget. Let's double the budget. Let's make that the target. Uh, it may be farther than we can get to. I don't know. Um, but I think that you've you got to have the goal, and you've got to be persistent, and you've got to have the relationship. Don't forget your audiences. Because you know, artists coming and saying, fund me so I can get a bigger salary doesn't work as well as somebody saying, I love the arts, it's incredible for my kids or my grandparents or whatever. Um, you need to do this. Uh, and bring a friend, bring 10 friends. Um. Yeah, thanks for that, Spencer. And, and I would say that, you know, the Alliance, because we are involved in advocacy, we do a lot of things like arts votes, campaigns, and things like that. And our, so our newsletter, which comes out once a week, has all kinds of advocacy information in it if you want to get involved you know, subscribe to the newsletter, go to the website, and just sort of see, you know, what's possible there. So thanks for that. Now, last but certainly not least, with I think a pretty um, upbeat and positive story, we have David Payne from Music on Main and um, uh, the Post at 750. Take it away. Thanks, Brenda. Um, the Post at 750 is located just across the street in the CBC building. And it's a work and rehearsal and meeting space uh, that was built by the arts, for the arts, um, but it's available to everyone in the public. It was uh, created in 2014, very quickly, uh, with conversations started in 2013 by the Push International Performing Arts Festival, the Touchstone Theatre, Doxy Documentary Film Festival, and Music on Main. The four of us came together and we formed the 110 Arts Cooperative, and we did that because we wanted a governing body for this space, this 8,500 square foot space that we built. Um, the city of Vancouver received space inside the CDC building as part of their cultural amenity program about 15 years ago, 12 years ago, when, um, uh, the, when CDC was building their new broadcast center. And so part of their amenity that they needed, to, that they offered to provide was a space and 30 years availability, a, a raw space that needed to be built out. Um, the city first offered it to three other organizations and said, hey, just go raise a million dollars and you can have access to this space once you've built it out. Um, really hard to raise money for leased space. Uh, raising capital for a space that you know you're going to get kicked out of at the end of the lease, or you have the possibility of getting kicked out of at the end of the lease is very difficult. So the city um, 
let the space sit fallow for a little while while they found another opportunity to be able to contribute cash to the project in addition to the space itself. And the city um, negotiated a $1 million contribution from TELUS when they built their new, uh, their new facility, their new headquarters, just a couple blocks from here. And so that wasn't a sponsorship, that was actually just a pure cash contribution that was dedicated to this space. And then they had a, um, a public opportunity for organizations to come together and to create a co-location in the center of downtown Vancouver. So Push and Touchstone and Doxa and Music on Main had already come together, partly knowing the space would be available, but also knowing that we believed strongly in the idea of co-location. That by being in a space together, you know, similar to Beaumont Studios, there's an energy that you feed off. And there are problems that you can solve more quickly. And you know, it's the idea that one plus one plus one plus one is more than four. And it really is true. So we were committed to finding a co-location whether or not we won that space. We were fortunate enough to win that space. It came with um, up to a million dollars from the city of Vancouver. We raised another 500 from the feds, uh, eventually 100 from the province, um, and a lot of private money as well. An individual was 250,000, the foundation was 210,000. People were very excited at this point to support the building of, um, of this capital project in downtown Vancouver. We had a few goals, and I, and I want to come back to what Colleen started the conversation with, Love OM, um, uh, the, the poet Rilke. There's such a romantic idea around the poverty of being an artist. Um, there's this belief that if you won't die, if you make your art, that you're not an artist. Um, and there's a, a, a cultural meme that has just gone on for you know, time immemorial, or at least since at least for the last couple hundred years, that it's almost required to be in poverty to be an artist, and somehow a wealthy artist is a dismissed artist. Um, when we were founding the 110 Arts Cooperative in the close to 750, the idea of artists and poverty and instability was something that we were that we fundamentally disagreed with. We know that poverty and we know that instability does not lead to good art. We know that it leads to instability and it leads to opportunities that are missed. So we wanted to um, create a space where artists and primarily on the performing side and, and moving art side could make art, could rehearse in safe spaces and also in downtown Vancouver where the arts had fled because there were no available spaces to make art in downtown Vancouver. Um, Vancouver Opera has their amazing creation space over on Commercial Drive. They used to have offices and rehearsal spaces in downtown Vancouver. Um, the, you know, everybody had left the downtown core in terms of rehearsals, save for the Vancouver Symphony and the Dance Center. So this was, for us was about returning it, um, returning art to downtown, and also more the independent arts level. So um, no organization has a budget larger than two million. Um, the, the budgets range from 400,000 to two million. I think that something's important to say about that is that means that we're not um, the organizations like Vancouver Opera, Ballet, um, Symphony that are the best connected. Um, we're very well connected and we're really supported by the, um, by the community and we have amazing donors and we're very fortunate in terms of our stability. Um, so but we're, we consider ourselves independent parts. Um, we're a bit able to be a bit more flexible because of our size than some other organizations are. Um, but it's also really important to recognize that we're for uh, extremely high-performing professional arts organizations with exceptional leaders. And so we were able to build from winning the space in February to raising $2.5 million, hiring an architect, hiring the construction firm, um, going through all the regulatory process, dealing with CDC as a landlord, um, where, with the city as our in-between with the leases, dealing with the leases with the city, um, we were able, as uh, a fifth organization, as these four organizations coming together, to do that from February 2014 and start moving in in December 2014. So I, I couldn't do my kitchen that quickly at home. <laughs> um, so, so I think it is really important to recognize that in this conversation about stability and about how um, the real estate crisis in Vancouver affects artists, it's important to um, to acknowledge that we that. Everybody has a right to a home, uh, and not everybody has the ability to advocate for that right. Um, organizations and the arts require space to make art happen, but not every artist and not every arts organization has the ability to advocate and to, to organize uh, for that. So 
we're in a very fortunate position, and, um, and that's one of the ways that we were able to make this happen. Um, Brenda asked me in advance of this panel to speak a little bit about you know, what does work. We chose a cooperative model, so we formed it as a cooperative so that we could um, have kind of equal ownership, although it's a, it is a, a charitable cooperative, so the, there are only four members, the four organizations that I've mentioned. But we operate it by and for its members. So we think that this gives a greater sense of responsibility to the space and to the idea of what the space can achieve. Um, we, uh, looking at my notes, one of the greatest things that we were looking for was a sense of camaraderie and the co-location benefits from that. So all of us are finding that we can solve problems more quickly, whether it's a fundraising problem or a production problem, because we have all of our colleagues around. And one of the things that we really put at the beginning of this process and that we thought that we should advocate, or that we should really make a big part of change is something that's been a thread through this conversation, which is that um, the arts are not central to the conversation of being in Vancouver. So how can an organization like the 110 Arts Cooperative in the space that posted 750 help return or help grow the idea that the arts are central to our lives um, as part of just something we talked about in Vancouver. Uh, there is amazing work that happens here. We all know that, we all participate in it, and yet it's not the first thing we talk about at a dinner party. So um, we really wanted to become leaders and advocates around that, and that's something that I think that we failed at in our first four years, is um, trying to get that extra capacity to do things that are outside of just the operating of the space and the operating of these four organizations. Um, so that's, I think, been one of our greatest challenges to sort of see this opportunity, but to manifest the opportunity around advocacy and um, a different kind of leadership. Um, so that's, I think that's, that's been one of the challenges of, of that space. But I do think in general the idea of um, co-location, cooperative, um, is there, there is no way that any one of these organizations could have achieved the project to the level that we were able to achieve it on our own. And I don't think that any of us would have cared as deeply about the project um, if it had been a, a different sort of governance model or, or another organization creating it so that we could just rent from them. Um, there was a moment where Minish Schenlinger, who was one of the founders, was approaching me to come main about it, and I said, you know, because it sounded like a big hassle. Four artistic directors trying to get along and building a space. <laughs> uh, I know my ego, and I could imagine everybody else's. So, so I said, you know, we also would be very happy just to rent. And Minish's immediate response was, oh, if you just want to rent and not really participate in the space and participate in what the space can be, then that's not a good fit. And I started to get even more excited about what was possible there. Um, it's, yeah, it's, it has been a huge success. We are in an exceptionally fortunate position where we created um, in our initial fundraising reserves so that when the carpet needs to be replaced, we are, we're going to be able to replace the carpet. Um, we all have huge rent increases to be in the space, um, but we've been able to sort of absorb them now and been able to hold our rent to last year's prices this year. Um, but um, we were very conservative about the finances and we feel you know, very lucky that we have a stormy day fund so that if in the future uh, the one hours cooperative needs an infusion of cash, we actually do have, have a reserve there as well. So I'm very excited for that. Okay. Well, thank you, David. That's, it's nice to, to end with a, a good story, although, you know, I, I want to play the devil's advocate. Not really the devil's advocate, but one of the things that strikes me is your four professional high-performance arts organizations would it work a model like that if you had a space that was being shared by um, a daycare and a, you know, immigration services, all not for profits, basically, but all, you know, social profit? And would do you think that's a possible model yeah, as well? Absolutely, I do. Um, we're a rare, rare model in that within the arts, we're all different. We're theater, multidiscipline, documentary, music. Um, there are very few um, art spaces in the world that have that kind of mix of people, work, uh, organizations working in it. I think that it's the values and it's the idea of how the space can change the city, change the people who work in it, and change the people who come to make work in it. Um, and I think that, that if you can get everybody, if, if you have organizations with shared values around city building, whatever their vision of city building could be, it could be a daycare, a 
an immigration service and an arts organization. Yeah, it could be shared values, shared spaces. I think they go hand in hand, and I think it's, it's something to think about for all of us. Now we're going to have to open it up. Yes, Diane Cadota. Oh. I actually have, uh, actually have a mic. Oh, so great. I did. I just before we move on, I did. I did want to say that as um, uh, I recognize that we are representing a very large arts organization here uh, in Vancouver, um, but our issues are exactly the same. So we are in a leased building um, in, a, in a part of the city that we expect will get rezoned eventually. Um, we perform in a space that is far too big for our audiences and the work that we want to do. Matter of fact, today we were kind of hoping the art gallery was going to throw in a 1,200 seat uh, theater. That would be amazing if that could happen. But yeah, yeah, no, we need 1,200. Um, there's, there's that reality, and, and there's the fact that as we move into Boheme, there will be over 200 artists in the building making that show happen from all of the disciplines that, that you can possibly imagine. We're one of the largest employers of artists in Vancouver and creating a stable work um, life for them is we spend a huge amount of time ensuring that our, our orchestra, our chorus, our um, hair and makeup, our, everybody helps to make our work happen. The fact that we are their employer uh, sits very um, centrally to the work that we do. So, uh, and I, I know we're not alone. I know that Ballet BC and, and, and the SO is these larger organizations on the outside might look stable, but the reality is we're dealing with the exact same issues, um, and we we do have people that that were um, working very hard to support so that we could share stories of that one. I'm just gonna I'm gonna start with Dan. We'll break up. Yeah. So many questions. Well, you can get one. Yes. I'm just gonna do one. Uh, Dave, not every uh, co-location has worked in the city, as you may. No, I'm just wondering what makes uh, the post at 750 or what you, how you set it up so that it wouldn't have, wouldn't make the mistakes that have already been made in the city with co locations or? I, I think um, Push and Touchstone came together first and they had already worked really well together because their artistic directors founded Push together, so Katrina Dunn and, and Norman Armour. So there was a, a cultural fit there. And they went out looking for a cultural fit um, for the, the other organizations they would invite to the one or to the post at 750. What became the post at 750? Um, the we had a lot of conversations about why we were doing it early on, but I, I do think that it was kind of the dating process. Can I just be more I mean, yeah. a bit more specific? In another case, the organizations that co-located were spending so much time just keeping their own organizations going and um, mm -hmm. advocating yeah. and raising money for their organizations yeah. that the, the space, the cultural space, was neglected. And I, I'm just wondering how you separate you know, your own organization with the collective interest. Um, I think that from a governance perspective, founding as a cooperative made a huge difference. So the cooperative is made up of the four members, the, those four organizations. Each of those members is responsible for providing um, two board members to the cooperative. And we were very clear even before those board members joined that when you sit on the board, you're representing the co-op, and the co-op has to serve the members, but you are no longer bringing your, your organization's best interests forward you're bringing the best interests of the cooperative, which is to serve all four organizations forward. Um, so I think that there was a, um, a structure that uh, requires us to care deeply about the facility and the well-functioning of the space and the members inside the space. Um, and the, the structure that we chose, the cooperative structure, enforces that we um, regularly check in and do that. Over here after that. Yeah, over here. Yeah. I have a question. Uh, you was mentioning that the ballet, the DSO, they're all dealing with the same issue. They look like stable structures from the outside, but they're dealing with the exact same issue. Why aren't all of you unionizing? And how hard is it to? 
you seem to have the exact same problem. I mean, it's clear to everybody here, or everybody that's involved in some way in arts, you have the exact same goal. We'd like to take out the um, I think many of us have gotten together on many occasions and talked about how to advocate as a, as a group. Um, you know, there's no goal. They're a very large boulder of a very large hill. Um, put it together, a little bit slighter. Um, but you still have to go back to your organization and operate it. So, you know, every moment that you spend trying to work together to try to like push this boulder, you're failing your organization, and it just comes down to time, really time and energy and and, um, and money. Um, and that's I think what's really happened because I. I we met, met with another face that were here, um, and it, again, you have to go back to your, to your office, and then you know, you're answering phones, and you're fixing leaks, or you're you know, trying to get productions off the ground. So it's, 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 it's just a lot. And, and unions, the artists do have unions. Like there are the musicians' unions. Mm -hmm. There's a, an actor and a dancer's union, but there's not a union for an organization. And I would say is, is um, organizations, uh, as a leader of an organization, one of my biggest concerns is revenue. And unions don't solve revenue issues. Unions solve equality and workplace issues, but, it, but um, they don't solve the, the core nugget of revenue Would issues. they give you more leverage in front of government? No, I don't believe so. But, but that's for my specific organization. I, I believe very strongly in unions. Hi, my question is for Alex, mostly because you talked a lot about improvements that the city could help with in art spaces and all of that, but I've never really heard much about making them accessible as well. And again, David, hey, I've heard that your space is somewhat accessible, but not 100% accessible despite all the renovations. A friend of mine was part of a thing that happened there. So how would you address that? Because I know a lot of artists that are getting more into arts, who are disabled, who want as much access, and that the biggest barrier is non accessible places to perform, not even to attend. Like the Fire Hall Arts Theater has been completely neglected in terms of accessibility. And they said they've asked the city again and again, so how would you answer those questions? Well, I'm, I'm really glad you brought it up. I did very quickly identify as one of the barriers. And um, the fire hall has been a project I've been advocating for for a long time, certainly. Um, it's a, there's there's so many issues. So it, it was a top priority from our, our team. We, we struggled a bit in the capital planning process, so we are doing some, some work to try and move that along. But, you know, it would have been up to me alone. It would have been, a, it's, it is a top priority. <coughs> Um, the fire hall is actually a theater that's owned by the city of Vancouver, so I'm really glad you brought it up because it is particularly important to us and what we're really advocating for within the system, and I'm really glad you're here to talk about it, is that we need to make, a, number one, our city-owned facilities accessible. We got $2 million for all our <coughs> facilities for accessibility in the next four years. $2 million. Two million. So, so, so there's a few things we're doing. We're doing a study and, and doing um, accessibility audits. I mean, the the uh, playhouse, for example, has huge issues, particularly getting down to the basement. So we're, we we make sure the fire hall is part of the audit that's happening, as well as our civic theaters. And uh, you know, some money will be invested with our infrastructure grants. We've got um, a focus on supporting sustainability projects, so uh, accessibility projects. So Diane, for example, um, got funding to, to look at, or uh, Vim House, to look at what would accessibility uh, look like. So we're, we're, we're trying really hard. One of our um, other pieces is to look at when we're developing new spaces, how we really talk about accessibility in much, much more broad terms other than just physical accessibility. So we're hoping to develop some universal um, design guidelines. So I mean, I think it's a huge issue. Okay, we have time for one more question. Um, the uh, property tax issue came up a couple of times. I won't belabor it. But anyone who's interested, on the 31st of January, the Royal Architectural Institute of Canada is voting an evening to triple net pieces. Uh, that's hauling out local business. 
and making more space multinational, right? Uh, so if you want detail on that, come on 31st of January at the Museum of Vancouver. Uh, and a footnote to that, a crucial issue in Vancouver is the nature of our property assessments. We have the strangest property allocation in North America, where most of the taxes go on to uh, businesses and industry, very light on housing, especially west side of the housing. Uh, I mean, we class about that in the global mail 10 years ago, and yes, the last council has been trying to adjust that, but it's a structural issue. We have the tax, uh, tax regimen of, uh, of a resource mill town or a, a place like Aspen or Whisper. No other city so skews things this way, and that's the big issue. And I think it's the loss of commercial space and industrial space. Yeah, so we don't have a lot of industry, we don't have a lot of head offices, and that sort of thing. Okay, here's my real point. And I, just, I just want to interject one thing there, which is every time somebody tells you that their taxes are too high, you have to call them out. Because we have very low property taxes, and everybody says our property taxes are high because they have never looked anywhere else, and our, our individual houses are so low compared to what we get in services. Talk to the uh, Yeah, somebody from New Jersey. New Jersey. Yeah. Okay, here's the real point. Uh, the problem with spaces for our creation and for artists to live in are symptoms. I want to point out one very important disease, and I think most of us know about this, and I think governments are trying to do things, but we still have one of the lowest per capita arts funding ratios in the country. If you pull those figures apart, it gets worse. It's the government. Right? It, no, the no, provincial government. government. Not and as you take, look at the figures, a huge portion of that goes towards tax relief for the film industry. So if you disaggregate that, uh, I mean, we do end up at the bottom or near it. On top of that, for political reasons, the early 90s, I hate to say it, under the part of the government, there was a skewing of funding that could be spread around and to communities and to uh, community arts, basically. There's nothing wrong with that. But the way art funding works in BC is it's skewed towards film first, to local community part-time artists, and at a survival rate only to big organizations like VOA. What is missing from this picture? Funding for mid-career artists. The people for whom the uh, ratio of their income allocated to housing is huge. I talked to my friend, I, I taught and lived and worked in Alberta and Ontario and Quebec. We do not support mid-career artists, and that's the crisis, and that's why we're losing people at the height of their creative abilities. And I think if we look at raising mid-career funding for creators, that would solve a lot of problems easier than trying to build paddle lodges for millennials. Or you would have an um, amazing environment for conversation, but if you keep going, I'm going to have to give you more of a rest